Today in this video, we're going to be starting our probability unit, just looking at some of the basic concepts. Some of this you probably are familiar with already, uh, but a lot of it's just vocabulary. Uh, we're not going to be getting into a lot of new things yet at this point. Uh, we'll start off with, though, in probability, we have what's called the rare event rule for inferential statistics, which says this, if under a given assumption, the probability of a particular observed event is extremely small, we conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. Now, extremely is a vague term, so it's a little bit open to interpretation, but that's what the rare event rule is. If it's extremely small, we tend to work under the assumption that eh, it's probably not correct. Which leads to them this, that when statisticians think about this, they tend to reject explanations based off of very low probabilities. But they also avoid using absolute statements, like uh, Luke Skywalker here saying, that's not true, that's impossible. Well, a statistician would say, well, it's probably not true, and it's almost impossible because they don't like using absolute statements. There are absolute statements in statistics and in probability, just typically people avoid using them. This is gonna come back later to us when we talk about, if you recall, when we talked about standard deviations, once you get past three out here, it's considered rare. So uh, later on when we get back to the normal distribution, which we're not gonna talk about a lot during the probability unit, but we'll get back to it. Uh, then we're again have those rare events way out at the edges there. All right, some more vocab, a procedure also known as an experiment. Like flipping a coin, rolling a die, that would be an experiment or a procedure. Is a situation involving chance or probability that leads to a specific outcome. Notice this is the definition of a procedure in the context of probability. We're not talking about a medical procedure here. We're talking about a probability situation. An event is any collection of results also called the outcome. Typically, I'll just use the term outcome of a procedure. A simple event is an outcome or an event that cannot be broke down into simpler components. For example, if you talk about the probability of flipping a coin, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It's what's considered a simple event. But if you talk about, uh, let's say, that your car has a flat tire while at the same time you're getting hit with one inch hail? Okay, that is no longer a simple event because you're looking at the probabilities of, of two things happening or occurring at the same time. Not necessarily that they're rare, it's just that there's multiple things going on there. A sample space is a procedure, uh, for a procedure, excuse me, is the set of simple events. A sample space, it, it could be an equation, it can be a picture, it can be, basically, you're somehow describing everything that could possibly happen. That's not necessarily a textbook definition of sample space, but that's really what's going on. You're describing everything that could possibly happen, and there isn't one correct way to do that. Um, let me give you an example here. If you flipped a quarter, what could possibly happen? Well... An example of an outcome would be a heads, but what could possibly happen, the sample space, well, you could have got a heads or you could have got a tails. If you flip the same quarter twice, the possible things that could happen, the events that could happen are here, but the sample space, well, you, you might have got two heads in a row or heads and then a tails or then a, maybe two tails in a row or a tails and then a heads. This is everything that could possibly happen. So that's what a sample space is. And it can, it can be a picture. At the beginning of this video, there was a picture of every combination that could possibly happen when you roll two dice. Equally likely. If an event is considered equally likely, um, each outcome should occur with about the same frequency. So let's say like dice, okay? As long as they're not weighted dice or somehow people are cheating, uh, any side should, the frequency should show up about the same as any others. Now, we know with randomness, we could get a streak of the number two, you know, 83 times in a row. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. 
That's not what this word has to do with. This just is describing what's equally likely. That in general, when you look at this, each side generally, if you look at the frequencies, would show up about the same number of times. Same with like a, a, a spinner board like this. I'm going to kind of skip through this a little bit because I think you guys get the idea. Here would be an example of not equally likely. Uh, a fire drill. Well, you only have about five of them a year uh, in a high school, so each day would not be as equally likely as any other day of having a fire drill. Um, so that would be an example of not equally likely. Some notation, if you see the capital letter P, and we're talking about probability, it means probability. This is not going to be percentiles. In fact, you're not going to see P used for percentiles really anymore in this class. P here is going to represent probability. And then there's going to be some parentheses, and inside those parentheses there's going, going to be stuff. A, B, C is listed here, but usually it actually can be a word or something. But the probability of this is the event is what we're talking about here. Probability of some event. Relative frequency, which is also called experimental probability, is an approximation probability that is an estimation based off of counting if you're taking notes, put that next to this one. It's probability based off of counting number of times the event has occurred divided by the number of times the procedure was repeated. So for example, these are hubs for axles for some trailer. Let's say that the manufacturer wants to look at the probability of a defective one. Well, maybe they count out a thousand parts. They, they randomly sample a thousand parts, and out of those thousand parts, maybe there's, there's, you know, two that are defective. Well, then to get the probability of a defective one, it'd be two divided by a thousand. And this is based off relative frequency. These are not equally likely events. At least I hope if you're a manufacturing that defective parts are not equally likely compared to the non-defective. Otherwise, you better figure out a better way of manufacturing. Classical probability requires equally likely. Put a star next to that, okay? Requires equally likely. This is the one that most students are introduced to at a younger age, about eighth to ninth grade. Typically, it's probabilities of dice and cards and things that intuitively students already realize are equally likely. They probably wouldn't use that vocabulary at that age, but intuitively they have that idea. So it's the number of ways that the event can occur divided by the number of different simple events. Okay, so for example here, the probability of drawing a king out of a deck of cards. If you don't know cards, there are 52 cards in a deck. There are four kings in that deck of cards. Uh, so the probability of getting a king, there's the king of spades, king of clubs, king of diamonds, and king of hearts. It would be four out of the 52. Okay, so we can calculate classical probabilities. Relative frequency has to be based off of counting, so you have to have an active part in it. Classical, you can do it with your calculator. You can calculate the probability. And then we have subjective. Subjective probability is an estimate based off of knowledge of relative circumstances. Okay, so for example, uh, let's say we take uh, two five-year-olds and they're going to the dentist and you're talking about the probability of them having a cavity. Well, the one five-year-old has never had a cavity, and the other one has a cavity every single time they go because they eat lots of junk food. Well, mom's probably going to make up some number. You know, 90% of the time, you have a cavity, something like that. It's based off of an educated guess is another way to describe it. It's an estimate based off of prior knowledge of relative circumstances, which is a fancy way of saying it's an educated guess based off your observations. Another example of this would be the weather. You look at the weather to see if it's going to rain or if it's going to snow, if it's going to be cloudy, if it's going to be sunny, all of that. And, of course, they can't base it off of counting because if you're looking to see what tomorrow's weather is, well, tomorrow hasn't occurred yet, so I can't count it to describe the probability of, say, rain. 
I can't do classical because raining and not raining is not equally likely. So I can't calculate it. But what I can do is I can look back in my records and I can say, you know, with very, very similar type of weather patterns, 80% of the time we seem to have rain. It's an educated guess, even though I am counting. I know I'm counting how many times we've had rain. It's still an educated guess. So that would be an example of subjective probability. When you talk about probability of uh, relative frequencies, so things you have to count, again, uh, like a number of bad parts or, or how many people have red hair in a crowd, something like that. The law of large numbers tells us that relative frequency approximations tend, doesn't mean they have to, but they tend to get better with more observations. So if I'm trying to find out how many red-haired people live in a certain town, if I pull up to the gas station and see three people and one of them is red-headed, well, yes, I could say there's a probability of one out of three, but that's a very, very low number of observations where if I counted, say, 8,000 people in a town, and then how many redheads, that would probably be more uh, accurate, whatever that probability would turn out to be. Uh, we do have to remember that there's always randomness when it comes to probability, so that's, that's the word tend. It tends to get better with observations. But yes, you could have those random things, and they just never go away. What do you mean by this? We always have to remember that there's randomness. And that will be part of our calculations. The common mistake is to, in probability, is to assume that things are equally likely. So going back to the color of hair, okay, so we got redheads, we got old white-headed people, we got blonde people, we got brown-haired people, we got black-haired people. There, I believe that's five if I kept track there. Uh, to say that the probability of running into a redhead is one out of five, I would have been assuming equally likely, where I think you know that redheadedness is not equally likely. Remember that if they're not equally likely, you can't use classical probability. We cannot just calculate it. We have to use counts or subjective, which subjective is not looked upon well, we'll put it that way, because it really is just your opinion. The probability of crashing or not crashing a car, you get in a fender bender, it's not 50-50. Classical probability would say, well, it's equally likely. So I leave tonight, I have half 50% chance of getting into a crash, 50% of not getting into a crash. Well, just based off of experience, that does not seem right because I've gone a lot of days with no crash. Not that it couldn't happen today. But I've gone a lot of days without it, so it seems like it should have a very low probability. Since they're not equally likely, we do have to look at frequencies. Well, and there's ways to do this. We can look up data. Uh, for example, in the United States, in a recent year, there was 6,511,100 cars crashed among the 135,670,000 cars on the road. And so you might say, well, I can calculate it that way. Um, yes and no. I would argue that, okay, there's this many cars on the road. They're traveling at least probably once a day, some more, some maybe less. So you'd have to still multiply this by 365. And then you would want to take this divided by that. But to make it even more complicated, you're going to have people that live in more congested areas, say like Los Angeles and less congested areas, say like Nowheresville, North Dakota, where there isn't another soul for two square miles, well, then your chances of crashing are way less up in the corners of North Dakota than they are, say, in Los Angeles. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into like uh, insurance companies, how they calculate this stuff. But they can still use some numbers to try and figure it out. So this way, I would say this is a very simplistic way of doing it. Let's say I have a 4.8 or about a 5% chance, which means about five times out of every 100 days, I would be in a crash. Like I said, that just doesn't seem reasonable. And that's because it's, even in this case, that's how many cars, but the crashes occur when you're driving. 
So you'd want to go, well, how many times are these cars driving in a year? Because this is for a year. So you got to put a lot of thought into these things and not be tricked by the numbers. All right, let's keep going here. Let's practice this a little bit. Types of probability. So we have these three types. So we're going to have a little fun here. So there's this gentleman here, and he's looking to get a date. And I'm sure you've heard the expression before, not if you were the last man on earth. So this guy, if he were the last man on earth, what would be the probability of getting a date? Well, let's look at the three types of probabilities to determine what that is. If it was classical, in classical, it's two equally likely simple events. The two things would be getting a date or not getting a date, which of course would make it yes or no, or 50-50 chance. Eh, maybe, maybe not. Relative frequency, that's based off of counting. Well, let's say he's been turned down twice, or he's asked twice and been turned down both times for a date. Well, in that case, based off of just simply counting, it'd be zero out of two, which means he's got a no chance, no chance in, at all of possibly at all getting a date. Well, that might seem a little extreme as well. So we've got kind of, kind of the extremes here. So I would argue maybe in this situation, subjective is probably the best choice. Of course, based off relative circumstances, if he really was the last man on earth, well, you know, there's four billion girls approximately. And if it's just him, then we, you could do some some rudimentary calculations here. And, you know, well, that's a one out of four billion chance. Or maybe you could say a four billion to one, you know, depends upon how badly everybody wants a date. And, you know, you could play around with numbers and have a little fun a little bit. But I would argue that he's got some sort of chance of getting a date. All right, so let's take a look at this one. Gender of children. If I want to find the probability that when a couple has three children, that they'll have exactly two boys. Assume the boys and girls are equally likely. I know that this actually is not true. The frequency at birth is actually, for boys, it's almost 51%, and girls are getting close to 49%. There's actually more boys born than girls. Maybe lots of people don't know it, but that's actually true. Uh, kind of an interesting factoid is that, though by the age of 18, that it's almost exactly 50-50, because I would argue as a guy that we tend to do some stupid things as boys, and there kind of thins out the gene pool, if you know what I mean. So, back to the question. If you have a question like this, and you're like, oh, you know, I don't even know how to start this. A great way to start it then is by looking at the sample space. So here's the sample space of what could possibly happen. And we are going to assume classical, even though I know it's not exactly 50-50. So three kids, they could have had three boys. Or they could have had two boys and then a girl. Or a boy and then a girl and then a boy. And you can see what I'm doing here. I'm showing everything that could possibly have happened. It takes a little time to maybe list off a sample space. In this case, I'm just making a list. But when you're done, the answer becomes typically very obvious. There's two boys here, two boys here, and two boys here, which of course meets the criteria of exactly two boys. And there's three things out of the eight ways that this could go. And so it would be three out of eight. That'd be the probability of two boys. Why don't you give it a try here? I'm going to kind of go through this a little bit. Which type of probability? Try to ignore recent presidential elections. Try and put that out of your head. And just in general, the probability that the next president is from the state of Alaska. Well, there's classical, there's frequency, and there's subjective. Which one should be used? Okay, if it's classical, then everything's equally likely. There's 50 states in the union, so you would say that, oh, excuse me, I guess you could do it that way too. You could do 50 states in the union, go one out of 50, or you could just do a yes or no, and it'd be 50%. Relative frequency, that's based off of 
counting, there has actually to date never been a president from Alaska, which would imply if you were using based off of counting that there could never be a president from Alaska, which that doesn't seem right either, that it would be zero chance. So subjective. Subjective, you just kind of maybe look at some numbers and put together some thoughts on how you could take an educated guess. And this would maybe just be one situation. There's lots of them. But maybe I look at, well, 0.2% of the population comes from Alaska, so maybe I'd give them a 0.2 chance. I probably forgot the decimal there, 0.2 chance. Uh, but maybe because of its difficult location, I say, well, maybe not that much. Maybe I'd cut it in half just because of the location of it or something. I don't know. It's an educated guess. You're looking at relative circumstances and taking a guess. When you talk about probabilities, you got to look at what could possibly, the range of what could possibly happen. Well, the range is fairly simple. 0% chance up to 100% chance. That's what the probability of any event is. Uh, you can't go more than 100% and you can't go less than 0%. If it's 100%, we say it's a certain event, like Thanksgiving being on a Thursday this year. Well, that'd be 100% chance. Impossible events, of course, are zero, like the 4th of July being in September this year. Well, that's going to be a 0% chance. There are things that are certain, and there are things that are impossible. I just said that statisticians tend to avoid those absolute statements a lot of the time. At least they don't use them as much as other people do. I love this picture. I have no idea what happened here. I'll admit I just found it on the internet. But it reminds me that even though I can't fathom how this could possibly happen, that I shouldn't get too excited about saying anything's impossible because this shows you that, oh my word, just about anything can be possible out there. A lot of times in life, uh, what is the saying? Uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Complementary events. Complementary events has to do with that the two events probabilities add up to one. Uh, basically, it's the probability of one thing and its opposite thing, or say if the probability of A is something occurs, then not A. And these are the symbols used for not A. Okay, so you could, if I see this A with a bar above it, now that's, you're not going to see the, like the mean. That's not what we're looking at here. This is a capital letter. So not that, but if you see something with a bar over the top, uh, in the context of probability, it means not. So, for example, what I mean here is we've got the probability of rolling a six. Well, then the complementary event would be the probability of not rolling a six, which of course would be five out of six. The probability of rolling a six is one out of six, and when you add the two events together, you should get 100%. That's what this is saying right here. If you add on them, you get 100%, or if you take 100%, subtract the probability of one event, you get the probability of the complementary event of it not happening. I've already kind of described this. Let's take a look at a situation where using complementary probabilities actually helps us figure out the answer to a question. This is an old example that comes out of probability. It's called the birthday problem. Uh, you could probably Google this one. If you, as long as you throw the word probability in there, you're probably going to see this. The question is, in a class of 23 students, what is the probability that at least two students will share the same birthday? And when I say share, I mean the same day and the same month, not necessarily the same year. So, you know, both two students having a birthday of, say, April 4th, something like that. Well, one of the approaches you can take to this is to take the approach of them not having the same birthday. So that's that complementary. And since the two, uh, let's assume that the probability of the first person, okay, so imagine an empty room. One person walks into the room. What's the probability of somebody else in the room having the same birthday as them, or not, excuse me, not having the same birthday as them? Well, there's nobody else in the room. So it would be 365 days out of 365 days. Assuming equally likely birthdays, and I actually do not know, I've never seen a study whether birthdays are equally likely throughout the year or not. I have no idea, actually. That would be an interesting study. 
When a second person comes in the room, though, now the probability that the person doesn't have the same birthday would be 364 out of 365. Now you just continue this. The probability of multiple people then ends up being this. The first person walks in the room, 365 out of 300 100% chance that nobody else has the same birthday. Two people, 99.7% chance that they don't have the same birthday. Three people, and, and so on and so forth. So you get down to 23. Now what you're going to do is the probability of not having the same birthday, again, that's what that bar means, is not. Uh, so I technically have a double negative here, I but I wrote it so you would understand what I'm saying. In reality, I shouldn't have that there because the bar itself means not. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to take all of these, and so you did have to calculate them one at a time. And you're going to multiply all them together, and you're going to get a number. Now, that's the probability of not having the same birthday. The original question was what the probability that at least would would share the same birthday. Well, then I want to find the complement of this. So I'm going to take 1 minus that, or 100% minus that percent. The probability, if you have 23 people in a room, that at least two people have the same birthday is actually over 50% which is, this is very much so a counterintuitive problem. You'll sit there going, wait a minute, something doesn't seem right there. But actually, that's what it is. And I have found many times over the years when I've brought up this problem that there'll be two students in the room that happen to have the same birthday. Uh, it actually surprises me, even though I'm about ready to show them the math behind it. So kind of an interesting problem. Rounding off probabilities, okay, if the probability is a non-exact, so if it is exact, ignore this. If it's non-exact and not a fraction, round it to three significant digits. What I mean by significant digits is this zero and this zero, they don't count. It's when you start seeing numbers. So here, I'm only going to include these three. Don't worry about the zeros. So I'd round that to 0 0.0424. This seven rounds that to a four. Okay, these are my three significant digits. And I know those of you that have had chemistry are cringing when I say significant digits. But it's a little easier here. We're not going to get into as many calculation things as you would in a science class. It's just pretty much if you got a bunch of zeros, don't count them until you finally hit a number, then start counting. Which is the basic rule of what you do in chemistry. If it's an exact decimal though, back up here, non-exact, we round it. If it's exact, you just leave it. Vocab, statistically unusual event is basically one in a thousand. If it's one in a thousand or less, we say, well, that's a statistically unusual event. So like, take this picture here. Is that unusual? I mean, if, let's say you just roll these six die and dice and you get sixes on all this, all of them. Well, that seems like it might be unusual. Well, you go one sixth times one sixth times one sixth times one sixth six times, and you end up with that right there, which a thousandth is like right in here. So yeah, that's way less than a thousand. So we would say, yeah, that's on very un. Well, I would actually throw in the very unusual. And actually, I haven't gotten there yet. But when we get out this far, uh, that's now you're approaching rare. According though to the rare event rule, remember we covered that for inferences. We probably would reject the assumption. So if you saw this, say you're playing a game, you walk out of the room for a second, you come back in and your little brother has all six dice like this, I would be really suspicious about it. That's what this is saying. I would reject the assumption that the dice happened. Could it happen? Absolutely. Random events. Does it happen? Hmm, that's pretty rare. I don't know if I'd trust my little brother on that deal. Odds versus probability. If A is some event, then the odds in favor of A are defined as the ratio of that to not that. Okay, this will make more sense with an example here. So for example, let's say right here, what's the odds of rolling a six? Well, what's the, uh, how many ways could this happen? Well, that's one out of six. How many ways could it not happen? Five out of six. 
And so what you'd end up with there, if you simplified one out of six divided by five out of six, you're going to have to flip the bottom one upside down and multiply, and the sixes actually end up canceling out to leave you one out of five. Now, probability is different than that. The probability is how many ways something can happen divided by everything that could possibly happen. So odds and probability are not defined the same way. Odds is how many ways something could happen divided by how many ways it could not happen. Probability is how many ways it could happen divided by all the ways it could happen. So they are slightly different, the definitions of these. Um, I don't go into much more about odds, but if it's something that you're interested in, on page 153 of your textbook, it discusses payoff odds. And I know that uh, in gambling they use payoff odds. One of the reasons it makes their calculations easier for how much you get paid if you happen to win. All right, here is some stuff to practice. Please take a look at that and do some practice. Have a good day.